I'll go ahead and introduce myself, Delinda Fisher with the Bionutrient Food Association. I'm a contractor for the organization for the last couple of years. Um, we invited this morning Kathleen DiChiara and Jordan Schmidt to answer the question about why nutrient density matters, right? Because we as BFA, our mission is to increase quality in the food supply. And what does that mean? So what we're doing as the BFA right now is studying quality and trying to define what quality is. And it's that relative quality that we're looking at in the lab in Michigan that we've been talking about. But we wanted to know, for the consumer, if you have this handheld device, this shiny object that we're talking about that we want to provide, it's like when you shine that on a carrot and say, oh, that's a good carrot, no, nope, that's a poor carrot, why should it matter that that's good or poor or excellent? Right? Why, why is it that I want that excellent carrot instead of that poor carrot? And so we've invited them here this morning to let us know <laughs> why to, <laughs> to share with us because it's complex, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, our systems are complex and the whole, the whole question is complex. But we want to know why does it matter that I eat that fine quality carrot? And so we're going to start out this morning. You have their bio, so I'm not going to introduce them. Um, Kathleen's looking for a clicker. The clicker just went away. I was hoping this would segue right into the clicker coming, right? But <laughs> maybe I can just advance it. Maybe we could just be old-fashioned. Um, but Kathleen's been um, kind enough to actually put together a series of slides this morning to kind of open up and frame this conversation for us and give us some understanding. The slides will really be a lot of what we're going to talk about, what Jordan and I are going to dig into. And of course, we want to engage you in that conversation. So we're going to be asking you some questions, too, at the end about why it matters to you. And we want you to talk with us so that we can offer you some insight, too. And then we can bring some of that information back to the BFA so that the communication going out to the public is some of the feedback that we've gathered from this room. So some of the framework that these slides are providing is just some of that overarching discussion about why we think it matters and some of the data that's been collected over the years. So some of, some of you may have seen it if you've looked at some of the slides in other presentations for the Real Food Campaign. We're, I'm re-emphasizing it here just because this is a standalone presentation, so if somebody at home is clicking on this presentation, they may not have been in that room or may not have seen that presentation. So it's just a quick highlight. So we don't have to dig into those details of the data, but it's just to reflect them in the concept of what we're talking about. Jordan, what do you have to say this morning? Good morning, everyone. I mean, Kathleen and I were talking last night about this there conversation. And it's important, part of why it's important for us to understand different reasons that returning nutrient density to our food supply is important is because we need to grow this conversation into our own communities, right? And so sometimes that felt sense is, is enough and sometimes we need conversation angles for the people that we're talking about or we need to be able to listen to their concerns and respond with information that works well for them. So this is also kind of increasing our capacity to have a conversation about why it matters. So we're just understanding the complex role that nutrition plays, because it is complex. Many of you have, who in that room has seen these uh, visual slides? So not everybody. Okay, so this is really just... Uh, so we've kept the Real Food Campaign a, a real secret. secret. Okay, so this, <laughs> is really... this is the data from our lab for last year. Yeah, so it's last year. So the data, there is a little bit more data this year, but some of the, the numbers are really the same. Uh, for this data, right? Um, and then we have 2019 data, so this is the 2018 data. So 90 of the poorest uh, nutrient carrots, or an lowest in antioxidants, were equal to one of the highest. Okay, so that's what it would look like if we were to scale it. And so then if we look at calcium, six carrots is equal to one. Copper, eight carrots equal to one. Polyphenols, 200 carrots equal to one. This is so huge. These are huge variations. This is huge. 15 carats equal to one in potassium, 10 carats equal to one in sulfur, zinc, four carats to one, and then we go to spinach. Same thing, huge variations in antioxidants, 100 spinach leaves to one, 
14 to 1 in iron, manganese 16 to 1, phosphorus 9 to 1, polyphenols 75 spinach leaves to 1, <clears throat> potassium 4 leaves to 1, selenium 4 to 1, copper 3 to 1, so not huge variations there, 10 to 1 in sulfur, magnesium 15 to 1, zinc 6 to 1, and then, uh, so those are just the numbers, you know, in general on those two particular, and so then I, what I want to talk about here is that when we look at that data, it's like it's interesting, right, and we see those huge variations, but now what we were talking about a little bit yesterday was how, how do we make sense of that from the growers' perspective and then the consumers' perspective. And we want to look at the, the epidemic of chronic disease as maybe a starting point to start to make some of those relationships. And I, for me, anyway, it's interesting to look at things like human behavior. We know that people are certainly not consuming uh, lots of vegetables. So if the numbers are lower, there's huge variations, then that would be something that would be important. Thank you. Um, so today, over the half of the world's population is affiliate, has some chronic disease. Many people have multiple chronic diseases. Um, one third of their living years is lost to chronic and preventable disease. So what we call it living years is that uh, even if they're not dying, they're losing their active life. Okay, so that means they're disabled, they have no active life. So that means they have a preventable disease uh, that's likely linked to lifestyle, diet, and lifestyle and they're losing one-third of their life, their living years, to a preventable disease that is potentially linked to the quality of their food. So that's a, a, an interesting thing that we could be talking to people about in terms of the relationship to their quality of food. Uh, to make some of the relationships between the types of diseases that we see in the research, we can look at things like depression. Uh, microdeficiencies and depression is a major glo global health issue. Two billion people in the world are estimated to be deficient in key nutrients and minerals uh, related to depression and mental health. So this is uh, a leading cause of disability and we can see this is the research that I pulled just a sample of some of the studies. There are many more but this is looking at zinc, copper and manganese and then zinc, magnesium and selenium. So if we looked back at that data and we said what are some of those minerals that have some of the deficiencies? But then there's also, we have to look at the data in terms of their relationship with each other. So there is very specific relationships of minerals with each other, and that's important for us to be looking at and graphing as well. So even in the soil, there's relationships that the minerals and the vitamins have with each other, which is why I think the food is an important part of that conversation, because we can't be throwing individual nutrients at people that have illness and say, oh, you are low in magnesium, or you are low in zinc, or you are low in this, because we're not measuring the data in their body at all times. We don't know what current levels they have in their body if we're not running uh, labs on them. We don't know what, what, at an intracellular level, we don't know what they're currently storing. So if we put food in their body that has a well-balanced uh, mineral and vitamin profile, then the body will do what it needs and will take what it needs and get rid of what it doesn't. So we have to remember that that relationship we have with food is the intelligence that we're asking our bodies to do naturally. So these relationships are really critically important to acknowledge, um, which we can get into. So this is an example of the most common relationships between depression and the nutrients that we would see deficiencies in. There are more, but these are the ones that really consistently show up in the research as cofactors and as deficiencies and they're really common. Uh, I highlighted zinc because that one is just almost always there. We almost never see uh, a case of depression where the zinc levels are not uh, at its lowest. And what did we see the differentials in zinc? In, it was like well, six to one or something? Yeah, let's go back. And you don't need much zinc, right, in a, in a plant to uptake when you're, when you're growing crops, right, Mark? You just need a teaty bit of zinc. Yeah. It's like minutia So in this amounts. case, it's four to one in the carrot. Yeah. In this, in this data set, or data sets, have you looked at what 
But these just out of the grocery store that you've taken, or is this, is this, are you looking out of the field and then comparing to what, what soils look like uh, and seeing how that compares to the, uh, to the crop produce that you're getting off of those soils? Is that, is that what you're looking at? So, so these are the results of the Real Food Campaign, which is the project of the Bionutrient Food Association, right? So we started a lab two years ago. And last year, we analyzed 700 carrots and 200 and some pieces of spinach. And these are the results of that. So in that analysis, we were looking at all these elements in those foods. And they were coming from farmers markets. They were coming from farms. They were coming from backyards. They were coming from grocery stores. And, and if you were here last night with the keynote, Dan was talking about how to become part of the citizen science project and be and what we're missing are more of the grocery store yeah. foods, right? Because most of the people that were collecting product for us, right. you typically go, go to farmers market. I mean, you know, for me to go into a Walmart and buy food would be like, ah. but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but but we but I've done it, and we need people to do that yeah. to be looking at because I've looked at you know those foods versus what's being sold <laughs> elsewhere. So we want this broad spectrum, um, and so far we have the broadest spectrum that we have. Um, and it includes all those things. Yeah. And it also sounds like the next step of data collection is then, I mean, that was, John Kemp also was talking yesterday more about the farming and in collecting data increasingly with spectrometry as it gets better on the farmer's end and comparing that to lots of data input about soil conditions, microbial health, nutrient cycling, um, irrigation, all that stuff. So I think it's, it's a massive amount of data, but that is you know, that's the exciting thing, is that we've never really been able to connect all of those variables from both the farmer end and the nutrition end. And as Kathleen and I were talking about yesterday, we have so much to do in terms of then understanding what those dynamics really look like in the exactly. human body. So right. we're at the beginning. This is not, we're not going to have answers for you today, but it's yeah. this exciting process of discovery and seeing what are all the variables we need to plug in to make meaning out that's of right. this data. Exactly. And that's why this is so broad. I mean, I, I, I couldn't, we, we couldn't possibly, Jordan and I couldn't possibly take you down the rabbit hole of illness and chronic disease and human health and the complexity of what it means for us to look at the nutrient profile and human health because we would be here for a couple of weeks just to talk <laughs> about one disease and what it actually means and what it actually means to take a human down that experience of the healing process. I mean, I'm a living example of what it means to heal from chronic disease when you change your food. But for me to take you on that journey, would you would want to go there with me, Watch unless you want to cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, the, the, the point is that it is complicated, right? But what we're trying to say is that we have to look at some data. We have to start somewhere and say, what do we know? Uh, what do we want to look at? Where, where, where can we start to put some touch points so that we can start to communicate to the public? I think the hardest part is how do we start to take this message out to the average person and help them make that relationship between why the quality of their food is important and what would be their motive to change. We don't want to just get people to reverse disease. We want them to prevent it. We don't want to wait, wait for people to be falling apart at the seams to tell them, oh, we can get rid of that disease. Uh, you're in a very dangerous position. Let me try to help you get rid of it. It's a very difficult thing to undo disease pathology. We want people to not find themselves in that position in the first place, and we do not want our children getting sick. And 50% of the children today have chronic illness, and it is getting very, very, very complicated. We have to get to a position where our children are not sick that they are growing up very resilient and capable of living extraordinary lives. So if we are not willing to go, in, go into it with the conversation that these things are preventable and avoidable and that our food is part of that equation, then we've lost. So we have to be willing to have that conversation and we have to figure out what is the way that we do that. And people are either motivated by pleasure or pain. That's the, you're either taking pain away or you're providing them with pleasure. So sometimes disease is the, the place that you can access that conversation, and sometimes it's going to be pleasure. So we have to kind of talk about what that is. If they've already have disease, then that's an entry point where you can engage them in the motive potentially to change. Um, and, it, and it's a common entry point, right? It is. For many people, it that, is. that's how they start looking at their diet right. and, and what they're intaking and really paying attention to that process. Right. is when they do get sick. Exactly, yeah, yeah exactly.
So this is just, again, another example using the endocrine system, uh, looking at hypothyroidism, and these links here, again, zinc showing up, the B vitamins. I mean, you can even look, if you listened to um, Jordan's presentation yesterday, I mean, these are the these are the nutrients that were showing up for digestive health, right? Zinc, vitamin C, the B vitamin, selenium, vitamin A, I mean, antioxidants. These were all of the things that we were seeing, not for just a lot of the common ailments, but for digestive health. So again, this often the, the, same, the, same, uh, the same ones. And then for inflammation, which of course is very common with arthritis and uh, I don't know whether this is depression at the top, but these are for inflammation. Mm -hmm. Magnesium, manganese, vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin C, selenium, B vitamins, um, zinc. These are all, I mean, they just keep showing up over and over again. So a lot of comments. Now, there are always other cofactors, and there are amino acids. It, there's a lot of complexity underneath this and a lot of other uh, small doses of other things, but these are the really heavy hitters, and they're constantly showing up um, in these particular issues. And then micronutrients and obesity was a big one. Uh, so this was a particular research on uh, mothers in Egypt, and 80% of the mothers who were micronutrient deficient um, had obesity, 80% of them, when no other factors were changing. So it was really showing up, again, in specific conditions when the micronutrient um, factor was present. Okay. So we've all seen this face, right? <laughs> oh, every mother is like the bane of our existence, right? Like not eating it, it's not happening. You're never gonna make me do that. I actually, my youngest son said to me, when I'm six, I will eat vegetables. <laughs> Don't talk to me until that time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we were doing the documentary film and they set up all the cameras and it took hours and hours and hours. And the film producer said, put vegetables on his plate. <laughs> and he picked up his butter knife and he said, don't even think about it, or I'll cut you. And I was like, oh, for the love of Jesus. I'm right on film, and she just put the camera down. She said, that's it. You know? So we've all been there, and um, I'll just say that uh, it's just the struggle is real. Well, and, and, and can I add to that struggle? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, when you taste vegetables today, right, you taste yeah. that carrot that's coming from the store or coming from that bag, yeah. you know, with, that's all been cut up and looks pretty. What does it taste like? Chemicals. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Is it no wonder yeah. that this boy is sitting there going, right. why would I want to eat that? Exactly. It, it doesn't taste good. Yeah. My 16-year-old told me the other day, this strawberry tastes like chemicals. It was an organic strawberry. I said, yeah, well, you shouldn't eat that. <laughs> you need to put that down right now. Yeah, do not eat it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, this was... Uh, you know, human behavior to me, I think, is just fascinating, like why are children rejected? And I will show you a particular study, which was, I think, from 1926, uh, from a pediatrician that was very fascinating on ch childhood behavior. But I just wanted to point out that, like Delinda was saying, there's always a reason why we're doing a, something or not doing. But I wanted to talk about the human behavior. This is um, the average intake. So these are recommended, what we should be doing and what we're actually doing. So <laughs> weekly intake. Uh, by years, right? So men and women by years, we're supposed to be doing this in terms of what we're supposed to be consuming, and we're not even close, right? So we're, we're, we're not even consuming intake on what we really should be doing. And across the board, we know this, right? People are just not eating the volume that they should be. Starchy vegetables, same thing. Other vegetables, same thing. And you know, it's pretty consistent across the board. Uh, legumes, pretty low, although women seem to be doing a little bit better early in life, although men too. Um, and then sugar. No, we have well exceeded it, flips around the other way. So that's the only place we're exceeding uh, the recommended uh, intake. So we've, we've mastered that and exceeded. We're outperforming in sugar intake. And so this was the study I was talking about. In flavor, flavor drives nutrition. If you haven't read uh, Fred Provenge's book, Nourishment, I highly recommend mm -hmm. that, where he really talks about animal behavior and why the animals choose particular foods. Um, and so this really speaks to, this is a Chicago pediatrician, and they were, women were struggling with their own children. Why are they not eating? The um, culture was really moving towards vitamins, and our children are not getting enough nutrition. We should start supplementation. And she did a radical thing. She took 15 babies. Uh, they were uh, in orphanage. And she did uh, a, a basically um, 
a, a crazy thing by making the children choose their own food. Okay, with nurses the standby, they were not allowed to do anything to the children. They made the children go over and choose what foods they wanted on their own. And the children um, chose things very specifically, like um, only liver, liver and orange juice, um, bananas and barley. But they didn't go across the spectrum. They didn't you know, have lots of little things. They just had a high volume of one thing at a time, like an excessive amount of liver and orange juice at one meal and then eventually. But eventually they basically had everything and they thrived extraordinarily. Even the babies that came in underweight ended up leaving much healthier than they were. And it was so radical that they were choosing based on flavor and the needs of their individual body. And it was just a very radical thing that she was allowing them to choose out of these 34 foods what they needed based on taste. And as we know, taste is coming from nutrition. And it's like what Delinda said, the food is really driving that palate. Um, so it was a really interesting, you can read the research, you can read the study and uh, look at that data and see what's happening there. And what mothers try to do oftentimes is force children to have a variety of foods. We want to look for that balance and we want people to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I'm guilty of that same thing. You need to taste this. You just have to have one bite uh, as opposed to letting them figure out how much they need of one particular thing and let them drive that on their own. So that intelligence, that information that we're asking our own bodies to do is really the benefit of increasing nutrient density in our food supply because in essence, we're really saying that if we improve the quality of our food, we can really ask that of ourselves, right? That we're improving flavor, but we can really improve that communication, that conversation. I was gonna say Jordan has. Yeah. Any advice on how after we've you know been eating for so long and we as adults have you know set kind of a standard in our heads or our emotions or whatever and eating is a way to get back to childhood child yeah to to, to uh, the beginning <laughs> is there a way to kind of get there to get back to that childhood set point right well, I think the simpler that you get, I think part of it is just getting a lot of the stuff out that's interfering um, with that communication. I think mostly what we do is we overcomplicate it, um, and it's really the other data inputs. I mean, food is not just the only thing we bring into the body that confuses the network. Um, so I would say that uh, there are lots of things that are getting in the way of us communicating with our food, and it would be to live a simpler life. I think also on the point of childhood, I, I don't have kids, but I have a lot of friends with small kids right now. And we live, we're in a farming community, so by and large, people are interested in this stuff and feeding whole real foods. And there's a lot of concern about that. It's been really interesting to observe, just not even in the most kind of um, controlled setting that that baby study was in, but just how it's playing out in real life. And this is a really, as someone working with nutrition, I get asked this question all the time these mm -hmm. days by parents who are like, my kid won't eat one thing a day or yeah. eats, is obsessed with two foods right now and I can't get them to eat these other foods and they're kind of in panic. And now that I've been seeing it come up so often, I have referred back to things like this being like, I, I think this might be the design actually. <laughs> yeah, 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 and if we don't worry about, if the options are whole real food and you're making sure that they are sort of have some exposure to those foods, then, um, and I had, I got some advice also from a holistic pediatrician who was like, think about it more on the like week or two week yeah. basis exactly. rather than a daily right. basis. And That's that right. is totally what I see play out exactly. in my friend's children. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you said that this was radical at the time. It was, yeah. And it seemed radical for your clients or your friends who were asking you this because um, it was <clears throat> I love that word. Um, I am just wanting to push a little bit for us to, um, the woman in the front of the question about you know, going back to childhood and that set point. I'm sorry, but I see the pattern of authority all over this stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, going back to childhood is reconciling our authority in life. Mm -hmm. It's not just about, you know, romantic. Mm -hmm. The movie coming from our parents, and the reason that this is radical mm -hmm. is because we have a very authoritarian approach to food. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for us to to um, definitely all of this nutrition stuff, 
and what is our relationship to authority? If we proceed with nutrient density, but we don't shed this authority system that's pretty invisible structure, um, then we're just not going to get where we Mm -hmm. So in that, in the context of that, what would you, what would you recommend uh, somebody who's trying to go back to their childhood eating behavior? I would recommend having, uh, doing some personal research into the history of myself and my family unit and the larger story around the relationship to food itself. Was it okay to steal food? Was it okay to have snacks at a certain time? Is there, you know, what are those power dynamics that we can find in those histories of our food? And I, yeah, Guido also in his talk on herbalism on Friday was talking about kids have a really, he was talking about bitter flavors. Yeah. And kids actually have a hypersensitized bitter palate. They have tons of bitter receptors on their, in their mouth and also all the way down their GI tract compared to adults. And so part, of, and that was, you know, the, the theories are that they also have a, a more of a challenge dealing with toxicity coming from the environment, and so that was sort of a protective mechanism that allowed them to really identify if something, if they were going to have trouble detoxifying something that they were eating, because we know that some of these bitters in small quantities are helpful and in large quantities are challenging, are poisons. And, um, and as we grow up, we lose some of those bitter receptors and our capacity to, um, in, you know, to enjoy, or actually we need that stimulation, we need increasing stimulation, so there's something that flips, but our culture has, kind of maintains that immature palate, so we don't, it's like we miss a step in our graduation in terms of food experience, where we play to a kind of a childish palate, mm -hmm. and then we don't get the opportunity to grow up with our food, and so we don't make that, our brain doesn't make that connection, oh, this is actually what increases my nutrient you know, satisfaction, which is really a lot of the messaging that should be coming from that phytochemical flavor is like, oh yeah, this is, what's, this is a nutrient density signal. Um, and so he was talking about, yeah, even just small amounts of bitter flavors, even something like a couple drops of a tincture, diversifying your flavor profile as a little bit of a practice, almost like a meditation, on kind of coaching your nervous system. It's like, oh, my nervous system needs to come of age when I'm thinking about food, and I didn't, I might have missed that opportunity. Yeah, and I love that, and I also think, too, that... Um, so uh, to piggyback on that, the bitter receptors actually go all the way down to the testicles. They're all over the body, uh, not just in mm -hmm. the digestive tract. They're everywhere um, in all the vital organs. I know. I don't have I don't any know. of those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm not sure I even want to know why they're there. But anyway, uh, and why that I know that is not even important. <laughs> uh, another conference for that. Um, so, uh, but I will just say that... Um, there's actually some really good research, too, on the people that are, are what we call super tasters. Um, and those are the people who have a really strong affinity for things like cilantro and then the people that hate cilantro. So bitter tasters is like 25% of the population. And they're actually sensing a, even the uh, excretion. So they're the people that like respond to the bitters in our food. But they're also responding to an excretion of a specific type of bacteria um, that is safeguarding us against... Um, things in our environment, so they tend to be protecting us from sinus infections and things like that. So kids that are prone to upper respiratory issues and things like that, they tend to be also prone to diabetes. Uh, these are people who are falling into this category. So this is, this is what I'm saying about how complex it's getting because the science is showing us that our bitter receptors are also dictating how much mucus we have in the body, how much sugar we're are sitting in the receptor sites, and whether or not we're going to be prone to infections and how we're reacting to our microbes in our environment. So there's, there is this complexity, not just to our food and the taste and our palates, and whether we like foods or not like foods, but also our response to specific types of bacteria and the excretions of those bacteria and whether or not we're gonna be prone to diabetes, how much sugar we're storing in our bodies and all of these other factors. So it, it's really a beautiful thing that we're learning all of this and we're learning that this is information, but this is information about us. And it helps us to better understand 
how we behave and what we're like and why we like certain foods and why we like sweetness and why we like bitterness and how we can use that type of information to modulate our own health and our experience with food and that we can use that to really dial things down and up. So when you have kids that are prone to certain things and when you can educate families that you don't have to have a child that's chronically irritated, inflamed and congested, that that is really <clears throat> the way that their body is built and that you can modulate that and they can modulate that. It puts them in control. Everybody is in control of their own health when they have the right information. And then when you teach them to use their food to communicate with their biochemistry, it's a really beautiful thing. Um, and I think it's a gift that you can give them. We just need to give it to everybody so that they can give it to their children. It's really that trickle down. It's not something that we want to own ourselves. We don't want the practitioner to have that information. We want mothers to have that information and fathers so that they can teach it to their own children. So I think that's the beautiful thing is that it's something that everybody needs to have access to. Um, yeah, so do you want to talk, talk on that or we can keep going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the idea of adults getting back to intuitive eating and allowing children to do <coughs> is one. But I'm curious about your okay. thoughts on how um, certain bacterial overgrowth in the body can disrupt that system. So for example, if you get overgrowth and you've got people causing to create sweet things all the time. And if you didn't know any better, you might intuitively think, well, this is what my body needs to what it's craving, but that's actually this other being inside of you causing you literally to crave those things. And I'm curious, just I guess what your thoughts on that are, how we get, if we're adults that want to get to that intuitive point, how do we discern between what is real and what is not? Mm. It was a pretty loaded question. It's a very loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, Jordan can answer that too because she she talked a little bit about that yesterday in her talk. But I would say most people don't overload on like maple syrup um, when they have candida. They're eating junk food typically, um, so that's not really intuitive <coughs> eating ever. Um, so I would I would say that our tendency is not to overdo mother's uh, nature sweetness um, in general and. Um, <coughs> And you're right that the microbes are really driving those cravings in many cases. Um, but with, an, with, an, with that type of intelligence, you can offset that. I mean, I think what Guida was really speaking to is that you're using the bitters to really, you know, off, offset that balance. You're, 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 you're asking the body to, to dial down some of that urgency for the heat or to try to really communicate with those microbes. Um, people are often, respond, you know, have, have a need or a craving for specific foods for a wide variety of reasons. It's not always the bacterial overgrowth or the craving for that particular food. It's often stress signals or high cortisol or other different reasons. I mean, there's a wide range of why somebody would be craving for specific types of foods or, or needs. So you do want to listen to it, but I think that um, it's very difficult to over consume the natural forms of any particular food. I, 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 would, I would argue that I've re very rarely have I seen that. Um, so I think that Jordan can speak to people maybe o o over craving um, in candida. A lot of people think they have candida overgrowth. Oftentimes they do not. Um, it's a <laughs> misdiagnosed, over abused um, uh, label that people are now have become attached to in, in my clinical findings. Um, Everyone that comes in with that diagnosis on the intake form, the lab results show they don't have it. Hmm. Yeah. Why do you think that's yeah, true? Yeah, I think it's I think it's very <laughs> complex. And what I see in my practice is I love. I think ultimately we are. The hope is that we are moving towards that intuitive eating. And what I see um, clinically, often in people's journeys, is there's kind of a. Yeah, it's like, it's like an ebb and flow of that practice. It actually takes us a really long time because we've grown up in a really hyper palatable, confusing food system, not our fault, very challenging for our brain and our neurobiology. I mean, it's basically playing on exactly what we needed to do to survive was to access the kinds of um, like calorie dense flavors that are coming in from, from processed foods. So we start with some confusion and then and then this practice, uh, but we're also 
uh, obsessed with dietary rules, right? Mm -hmm. We have this strange cultural dichotomy where we're like, this is as hard as it can possibly be, and no, don't mm -hmm. eat that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so people's relationship to food is really challenged, you know, especially women, but not exclusively. And when, and often I see people who've come in and they've done kind of a first round of intuitive, reading a book about intuitive eating or something was a big first step for them. It was like shedding that idea of like there's an authority figure who's going to tell me what to eat. It was owning some of I can, I can make these decisions. I can start to trust my body. Huge step forward in healing. But they get to a plateau because they still have all, they haven't totally learned about which foods contain which nutrients and even access some of the most nutrient dense foods and they're eating in a certain, you know, they're only intuitively picking from a certain spectrum of the food system that they've been used to eating from childhood or something. And so they're hitting a wall because they're like, I have been practicing intuitive eating and it was such a breakthrough and now I'm still sick or I, or I, you know, encountered this time of increased nutritional need. I'm postpartum and I'm really struggling something. Yeah. And then we work on, and then it's like, yeah, so this is time for a phase of, like, education and, and um, kind of more defined experience. It's like may, maybe not outsourcing to me as an authority figure, but outsourcing to me as a partner, as mm -hmm. an accountability partner, to be like this, based on what seems like it's going on in your physiology, I would recommend sort of for a time, I'm going to help you. I'm going to facilitate these, these guidelines, and I'm going to say, you know, emphasizing these foods would probably be helpful in de-emphasizing some of these foods, or maybe you've been working with some actually still um, ingrained rules from somewhere else that aren't that useful. And they go through a period of time of kind of following some of my rules and have another awakening in their capacity to intuit what is helpful for them. And then, and then after a time of that, it's like, maybe, yeah, maybe you need to shed those rules again. But now you have that experiential knowledge and it's going to inform the next phase in your intuitive eating. Um, so I think, and maybe during some of that time of working with me, we're specifically working on, it does appear like there's some microbial imbalance here. I do think, yeah, that I think um, sort of candida was a little bit of a, there was a wave um, and it definitely got, and I think, again, like fungal colonization, super complex and is, mm. is happening. We have a dynamic relationship with fungi yeah. just like the rest of the ecosystem does, you know, positive and challenging. Um, and our, it depends on what our immune system is doing um, with, uh, around that overgrowth um, or not even overgrowth necessarily, but yeah, around that kind of what's going on in our ecology. Um, but I, I don't always think, yeah, like, like Kathleen was saying, I mean, honestly, fungi can eat ketones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like yeah. we, they are very, um, our microbes are extremely adaptable, way more yeah. adaptable than we are. So no, like extreme macronutrient ratio is ever going to fix yeah. the microbial issue you're having, honestly, yeah. not that you couldn't dive into those for different reasons at different times. I'm not saying it's never a good idea to be in ketosis. It's just that's not the fix. We're yeah. thinking about the ecology more broadly. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Oh, yeah. Want to go ahead? No. I want to. Um, I found it fascinating that you were talking about the information that food brings into our body, and then it carries information in packets. Yeah, are oh, the exosomes? Yeah, can we can we talk about that a little bit? Is that appropriate at this sure. point? Sure. Yeah. So um, because I think it, it talks to that nutrient, you know, nutrients coming in. It's like what is what are they right. doing once they <laughs> once they arrive on my tongue? Right. So some of the research that I went into for my book that's coming out in February is that uh, I, so I don't look at food as medicine because um, the way I look at medicine is you get on, you get better, you get off. Um, so when I think of food, I think of food as information. Uh, food to me is, is carrying data and it's coming into the body with nutrients and complexity and polyphenols and fiber and carotenoids and soil information and um, things that we don't fully understand, right? And we're bringing it into our body at different stages and from an environment sometimes that we don't always understand. And 
the condition of our body is also relevant at the time when that food comes in. And I think it is that relationship and conversation that the food has with us that really is whether or not it's beneficial or not for us. Um, so some of that research that I went into really brought me down the rabbit hole of exosomes and looking at RNAs uh, that the food is carrying um, what we call cargo or data on the cells. So ENLs or exosomes, they have particular particles on the plants. So in this particular case, they were looking at ginger and the ginger has information on, this, on the plant that when it goes into our body and meets up with our gut bacteria, the gut bacteria essentially make contact with these RNA exosomes and uh, turn off inflammatory pathways related to specific diseases like colitis. So the, the plants are bringing information into the body that are turning off specific pathways for diseases. And I found that to be so fascinating. It was also true for grapes and uh, other particular, there were only particular uh, plants in that, in that study. But it really spoke to me that there was information or data inside the plants that we can't see, right? That was hidden in there that once it made contact with the human body and those bacteria made contact with the plant. And, it, and the key piece was that it survived enzymatic function. So once it didn't, it didn't break down in the digestive tract or the stomach, there was no destruction of it. It got right down where it belonged and it really had this extraordinary interface with the human body. And I just think that that's the magic we don't appreciate with this relationship we have with food, that there's, there's something happening that we can't see that we need to recognize is turning on and off disease pathology, that we just need to understand and honor, even though we can't always see it and measure it, right? And I just um, want people to um, be excited that the research is happening, that it's there, and it's exciting because then we can celebrate it, uh, but to also say there's probably lots of other things that we don't know are happening that we haven't yet been able to identify or recognize, and it really is those things that we probably um, intuitively suspect are happening, just like we know we feel good when we're in nature, and we know we feel good when we're near the ocean, and we know we feel good when we're near. There are a lot of things that we know to be true. We're not sure exactly why, and I think that that's probably true um, for the quality of our food. And so I just want to encourage people to, um, uh, to appreciate the unknown maybe is, is the message there. Yes. Uh, so, can I add to that? Yes. Uh, that's a very uh, topic close to my heart. Uh, what you're talking about is, in Russia, is called informational pharmacology, mm -hmm. where they refer to the information of the drug and not the drug itself, not the chemistry. Yeah. Uh, also, they, to uh, mention the flip side of that, which is that when you take a toxin into the body and you detoxify and you go through some program, you uh, typically do not detoxify from the information of the toxin. So th th think about information in, in a good and bad sense. Yes. Uh, and that thirdly, uh, information is stored in the water in the body. Right. And mm. so uh, that's where it goes. And then once it's in the water, it's all over your whole body. So it's kind of hard to get rid of if it's a toxin and uh, to that. So that's yes. Great. Subject. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Good. Excellent. And yeah. Do you want to talk about the food as medicine piece? Um, well, I <laughs> <laughs> did I just say something <laughs> against your <laughs> message? <laughs> 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 I don't think it said food as medicine. Yeah, 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 Anywhere yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, It probably does say it on the yeah. buffet website. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Not to dismiss anybody that. Right, and what, that's a good I think message. what this, yeah. I mean, it's a message that when we think about communication, yeah. so yeah. this is where there is this, you know, we're here already with a level of curiosity and an experience of this process, and so complexity is really interesting to us, and yeah. it's important. Um, and I think to bring it into the whole conversation is actually therapeutic for everyone, for our whole culture, because we're not good at it culturally, mm -hmm. and it's part of our pathology as a collective. Um, so to complicate things in this way of, it's, it, of 
system thinking and um, complexity I do think is really important. But to do that gently and also to do it in a way in which at the first access to information is something that people can easily, uh, makes an impact. And so I think the, the idea of food <laughs> as medicine is one of those um, impactful statements because people think of, you know, medicine is what we know culturally to be therapeutic or to reduce symptom profile. And so when we bring food into that conversation, it opens people's doors, you know, in terms of how they think about it. I, I, I really actually love that definition of medicine compared to information because I do think that, yeah, what we're looking for, this was kind of the, the what I was trying to get across in the talk yesterday, but if we think about our health as adaptation, if we think about illness even as an adaptive, a result of an adaptive strategy. So our body is adapting to our environment, whatever's going on in our environment, whatever information is coming in, whatever stressors are around, um, also sourcing from our past experience. So what has it learned is threatening previously or learned is safe and how does that compare to our current environment? That's where the nervous system stuff comes in what's going on in our gut ecology and how that's feeding back to our brain and what does that say about what's going on in my environment. And then, given the resources I have, which is not only nutrition, but nutrients are a big part of that, how can I adapt to this, whatever, this current environmental situation in a way that is most favorable to my survival right now, which might not be most favorable to me thriving as well as I could. Um, and, I, and when we look at it that way, then the nutrients coming in allow that adaptation, allow a, a lot more versatility in that adaptation. In this stressful environment, I might not have to make an adaptation that was so challenging mm -hmm. for my physiology. Mm -hmm. I might not have to shoot my cholesterol levels up to 500 milligrams per deciliter to deal with my level of oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. I might have some other options because I have an increased nutrient profile. And so in that sense, yeah, if we're talking about how food can help us avoid illness in our adaptive strategy, yes, it is, me you know, it's medicine in that sense. Yes. Um, because that is, it's like, oh, it broadens our capacity to converse with our natural world. I think that's a lot of, it's like if we think of our bodies as in conversation mm -hmm. with our environment all the time, yeah. how nuanced can that conversation be? How nimble am I in that conversation? If I'm not, if my resources are depleted, not very nimble. I'm going to have to hit that situation with a hammer as opposed to, oh, my physiology can adapt in this way that actually keeps me making energy and clear-headed and, you know, able to do what I need to do in the world. Yep. Hmm. Makes sense. All right, we're going to scroll <coughs> through. Um, so this is, uh, this is just to look at some of the other broader things we don't typically consider, which is, um, well, this audience probably does, but uh, <laughs> so chlorophylls, flavonoids, carotenoids, um, butanes, but so this is Deanna Minnick's work. Um, so she typically looks at things from the perspective of color, um, but you can kind of look at uh, over here on the physiological effects. So looking at the select phytochemicals and how they relate to specific effects in the body, anti-inflammatory, immune, antioxidant effects. So it's just a breakdown of the particular foods and vegetables, and the study is at the bottom. It's very interesting um, to make that correlation. And then over here on the side. So I'm just pointing that out, but it's a really a beautiful study, um, and people can really appreciate the specific phytochemicals and their relationship to uh, the physiological effects. So that's a nice way when we're pulling that data from the plants to start to overlap and look at some of those key components and how they uh, might relate to human health. So I just wanted to point those out there because it's nice to look at them uh, as they relate to the individual colors. But what we're, we're finding is the phytochemicals are really what's missing, right? Yeah, in, 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 yeah in much exactly, of what we're in much studying. of what we're seeing. Yeah. And I think what we were seeing yesterday is like, well, what do we measure and what do we look at and why, why are they important? Mm -hmm. And so then we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have researchers that have showed us why they're important mm -hmm. and what the levels are and what the physiological effects in the body and what they're regulating. And so that data is there. We have that information. And so if we want to get those levels up, it's an easy conversation for us to overlap mm -hmm. yeah, already. And yeah. I think it's fascinating. I haven't sorted through this in my own head, but when part of the conversation we had about digestion yesterday, what I see a lot in chronically, you know, 
clients who are navigating chronic illness is that they ha they're losing tolerance to some of this phytochemistry. Yeah. And it's a really, mm. it's like, what is the ecological pattern that's going on if our plants are being raised in environments in which they don't really have to produce that yes. phytochemistry for whatever reason we have, like, we've changed the, the growing conditions to be so undynamic that the plants aren't having to do their conversation, ecological conversation, which is what produces phytochemistry, right? That's plants conversing with their environment and their microbes and their, you know, pathogens and... And then, we, so maybe it's that, you know, potentially if I grew up without, le like didn't learn physiologically that conversation, if I was eating phytonutrient poor plants, I don't know. Right. But something about our, when, when our biology gets challenged or our microbial environment gets dysbiotic, we tend to lose some of the tolerance to the, these phytonutrients that should be very healthful. Yes. Um, it's like the stress becomes too much instead of helping us have a conversation about stress and resilience. And one of the primary things that we work on in my practice often is what is it going to take to increase our yes. capacity to tolerate and mm -hmm. respond to this phytochemistry. And it's a real puzzle. This is yeah. something, it's like, this is active <laughs> clinical yeah. research. I would love to see who's actually sort of working on it. But it's, and, it, and a lot of what it takes, it's kind of this stepwise approach of it actually takes nutrient replenishment, micronutrient replenishment, to build our capacity to deal with the phytonutrients better. So we're in this, like, we have to, we have to baby step this conversation yes. back into being in balance. If we replenish some of the micronutrients, can my body adapt better to the phytochemistry? As it gets in conversation with the phytochemistry, new stuff can happen in my microbial world because now I can feed those microbes and the feedback loop starts to be in a positive cycle. Right. Exactly. Because can you imagine right now if the population can't handle oxalates, phenols, uh, lectins, salicylates. We, we currently have a diet for every single uh, nutrient, polyphenol, phytochemical, flavonoid. There is, people are taking enzymes to break these compounds down. So we have a very no vulnerable, <laughs> weak, yeah, no phenol diet. There is a, literally a supplement on the market to break all of these nutrients down because the population is in a very vulnerable and compromised state. So what's going to happen when we increase those levels in our food? A challenging conversation that potentially right. is we need. Yeah. <laughs> but it's right. gonna, you know, so we we're need, saying yeah. Yeah, that this is an important part of human health and we need it, but we have a very weak population that can't handle it already. So uh, we, we don't want to be... A, not doing what we need to do for human health, but what we also need to be doing at the same time is helping humans become more resilient and more engaged with their environment and stronger people. And so, you know, a lot of my work is basically saying to people, stop avoiding the things, and, and as uh, Jordan is speaking to, is to say, what is it going to take for you to become the type of person that can ingest those foods and engage with those foods in a way that they are beneficial to your health. That's where the conversation needs to go. We need to be able to get people to be able to tolerate those foods so they can reap the benefits. Yes. One of the biggest ways you, you can improve your, your gut biome, I mean, your, your gut may already have a lot of stuff in there, but in low population, if you feed it right, it will grow those. Yes. But, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm skeptical of probiotics. I'm, I mean, I'm more about prebiotics than I am about probiotics. I mean, I don't know about kombucha. I don't know about, I mean, what about, <laughs> it's all good. you know, what about like vegetables that are grown in like really well, good organic biological form? I mean, is, is that an entry point? I mean, what's the yes. best way to get biology into your gut? Yeah, that's a great way. Yeah, and what so really what we want to do is to, yeah, increase the diversity of the microbiome so that it can obviously uh, take in these foods, and that, that is the direction that we need to go in, is to get people to have diversity so that they can start to break down a wide range of foods. So you're absolutely right. Um, the idea is to diversify the diet, and in order to do that, people need to have a healthy digestive tract. But they also need to have a healthy digestive system from top to bottom, not just the diversity of the microbiome, but they have to have good bowel production, good liver function, they have to have good peristalsis, they have to have good hydrochloric acid, they need to have everything working and they have to get the whole system back online. 
So I think that that's a really critical. And I think important. the nuance is important here. Yes. Not in, when we're talking about the general population, yes, yes. We're, a great step is just eating more whole foods, yeah. eating more vegetables, more diversity. But when we're talking about populations that are already challenged, sometimes this strategy of just, you know, prebiotics are good. We need more diversity in our gut flora. You should be eating all of these different vegetables, taking all these prebiotics. I mean, I, I have had clients who come to me after landing in the emergency room, yeah. after ingesting prebiotics on a recommendation of who knows, yeah. and having, being in so much incredible pain that they were, in the, where they were hospitalized. Yes. Because that was not an appropriate strategy for their GI tract where it was. That doesn't mean that that same thing that they ingested taken in, you know, starting with micro quantities, working on this whole digestive system north to south, yep. changing their whole relationship to food wouldn't be the appropriate support. Yeah. It's just that we, it's, we're, we get a little too, aggressive. yeah, yeah, aggressive <laughs> and broad in our approach. More is and better. we have to yeah. set up the system to generally, you know, it has to, it, we want the system to be adapting itself, to be making all of these different changes it's gonna need to balance out what happens when I'm, you know, feeding these species? So I'm going to have a big change, ideally, in, my, in the ecological dynamics, and my body's probably going to have to detoxify some stuff and really, you know, work with that change. Mm. So I do, yeah, I just want to caution curiosity at all times and not invalidating anyone's experience and, um, and working slowly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think this is a really great point that you're making. Like, so many people are now, they can't eat pod maps, and they can't eat oxalates and they have to be on they don't do it well with nightshades and all these things are triggering them. Yes. What do you do? Right. There was a really interesting um, talk at a conference I went to about the oxalates where there's a guy from White Plains lab yes. Yes. who talked about autistic kids having aspergillus in that year yes. in their guts who yes. are making the oxalate. Yes. High levels of oxalate. Yes. And then you're eating a little more spinach and stuff and it's just like Yes. But it's really it was the gut flora. The gut bacteria. There was a reason they couldn't handle any oxalate. Because they already had too many. Yes. And I think the same with the phenols and on, on the other stuff. Like if you're not, if you don't have the good gut box to break this stuff down, then you're gonna have problems. Right. So really, like you were saying, it all comes down to the gut box. Yes. And once you fix that, then you're okay with this. And right. these issues from north to south, because oxalates is a great example. Um, where, yes, you could be producing it internally with some kind of fungal species, um, which could be, like you were saying yesterday, an adaptive response to having metals that need to be detoxified. So those fungus are overgrowing, but it's because they're helping you out with heavy metals, but they're producing oxalates, so now your digestive tract is a little bit compromised. Yeah. And though, also, if you jump into, you know, it's going to, ketogenic diet is going to get a bad rap from my conversation here, but if you do something like jump into a really high fat diet, it doesn't even have to be ketosis, Weston A. Price style, you know, you're like, I really need to pound the butter, I heard it was great, and, um, and your liver function is not in great shape, and your bile production is not in great shape, and your stomach acid isn't in great shape, and you are not Detox, you know, you're not digesting those fats well. The other thing that will bind to, like, you know, if we eat a, a leaf of spinach and there's calcium bound to oxalate, which is how it's supposed to be, traveling yeah. all the way through our GI tract and eliminating. That's why maybe spinach is not the best source of calcium, actually. Um, if I'm not digesting fats well, the fat is going to have a, a, you know, an electromagnetic pull on that calcium, right. and it's going to bind to the calcium and free up the oxalate and I'll absorb the oxalate. So it's also, it's this compound, you know, it's the gut flora is so important, but, and how are we working on the whole system simultaneously because I'm gonna have, you know, it's like I have to sort of troubleshoot at these different levels. I'm gonna have to improve my liver function and handle my aspergillus overgrowth potentially. Yes. All right, we don't need to stay on these slides any longer, but I wanted to point out because, um, this is also speaks to some of what we're talking about, and I just wanted to touch on it, in the synergy of honoring the whole. So this is a really good example of uh, when we extract a single nutrient from, from the whole and the risk. So this is not to criticize the supplement industry, but to just emphasize that um, we have a tendency to see something that performs well and then uh, we kind of go gung-ho on the active ingredient. Oh, curcumin is a high performer. It's an anti-inflammatory. And so then everyone is on curcumin, right? So we take high doses of curcumin. 
Um, but if, when we dig into the research, we see that curcumin in high doses is actually dangerous for our health. In low doses, it's actually very healthy. But when we take it and extract it out of the turmeric, um, away from the root and all the other 300 constituents, uh, we don't have some of the protection that it offers. So again, there are probably lots of other instances where we're taking specific nutrients and we're pulling them out of the whole plant um, and offering them to people in individual ways. And so the supplement industry is a massive, massive, massive industry. And people are self-treating um, with supplements all of the time. I love supplements. I think they're really a great adjunct to uh, the healing process for many people. And what you would do for a healthy person is not what you would do for a sick person. Um, but I also think it's an unregulated industry and people are sort of falling prey to a lot of information on the internet and a lot of information from each other. And I think um, I just it may be worth stating that people are also potentially making themselves sicker for a longer period of time by self-treating with supplementation. I'm just going to go ahead and say that. Um, I see it all the time. I did it to myself for a very long time uh, because I was under the illusion that I was getting better, but I was actually managing chronic disease holistically using supplemental treatments. And I think that I was essentially not getting well because I was pushing myself into various levels of imbalances and depletion with the intention of trying to get myself well. Um, but without knowingly, I was actually keeping myself in a diseased state. So to the extent where we can pull back that curtain and pull some of that supplementation away and move back to the food, I think that we will actually help ourselves significantly. And so I think it's worth saying. So I'm just using this as a particular example. But that's the end of my slides. And so uh, again, <laughs> we're, we're here to, uh, yeah. Um, Brigitte, one more question. Yeah, this is a great point. And I'd like to add something to it. Like, you're right, like a lot of people are reading something here and there and doing all the supplements and you can definitely, you can throw yourself out of balance because nutrients also have to be in balance. Like, yes. the calcium and medium ratio. So if you've taken a bunch of calcium, you're throwing out your ratio and then you can make things worse. So that's definitely the case. Right. But then like in, in terms of supplements, if you test what's going on and then target specific deficiencies, that's when you get the good results. Mm -hmm. If you do it blindly and don't know what you're doing, then yes, you can mess right. things up. Yes. But they are really helpful. It, you, obviously, food should be there first. You should definitely use food to the maximum you can and get as nutrient dense as you can and try to get all your nutrients from food. But for certain deficiencies, it just would take too long to fix something. So like for a certain amount of time, I feel like supplements are really helpful mm. just to get you faster. Well, I used to think that, um, too. I used to think that, too, that, well, if I could just get there faster and if I could just get my levels up, then I would solve that problem. Um, but I don't know that, that's, that I feel that way anymore because I think that uh, in many cases, you know, if I were to use the food, then there are things that are happening in the body that are also changing the human body. So when you take the food in, the microbes are eating the food. They're then producing propionic acid, butyrate. They're releasing and secreting mucus, which is then repairing the gastrointestinal lining. Um, you know, it, it's just, and it's also even in the digestive tract. I mean, when we eat, you know, a piece of meat and we take in B vitamins, I mean, there's a certain process that's happening with our digestive system that's then carrying that B12 down to the bottom of the small intestine with intrinsic factor. It's then meeting up with calcium down there. There's, there's a very complex process that's happening that we're overriding when we just take a B, B12 vitamin. And also, um, there's also B12 that's used in the small intestine that's, that's different than what's being used in the large intestine. And it appears that the microbes are using it to modulate activity um, that's different than how it's being used for brain health. So there's different purposes and how, you, how it's being used in a supplement form versus food form in terms of bioavailability. So there is, I, I don't know that getting there quicker is better, right? And I think that we're, we're missing some of those other things that um, are happening and that complexity and synergy that's happening. We're losing the fiber. We're losing the other things. Now, one would argue that if somebody's in poor health, uh, they don't have good digestive function, they don't have good absorption, 
uh, they're missing all of that and therefore giving them the supplement would be better. I, I used to think that might be true, but I think if the person is in comp compromised health, then you just give them smaller amounts of the food and really start to initiate that process. All the more reason to try to get them back on board and improve some of that um, initial function. So I'm not disagreeing with you, uh, Brigitte, but I think uh, to the extent where we can get them you know, uh, back to the original source sooner, I'm seeing better results than when I thought. I, I think the supplementation, I used to think, would, would lead to better results. I also think that we as people generally default to the supplement fat. You know, it's just our tendency is if you can give it to me in a pill, I'll take it. Um, I just think it's our human nature. So the minute you offer people supplementation, they're going to take that first. I did a six, I did a beta group, six weeks. I ran people through a program. I said to, you, to them, I, it's going to be a 21-day reset. I'm going to take you through the digestive process. I am not going to offer you supplementation. I am not going to tell you anything about supplementation. This is by design. Don't be disappointed because it's not going to happen. I'm not going to give you a single supplementation. We're going to walk through the entire process. At the end of the program, I did a survey. I said, if there was anything different that I could have taught you, offered you, given to you, what would it have been? Every single person in the group said, we wanted to know supplements. <laughs> what supplement would you have given us? We wanted to know what would you take for supplements. Even though we knew and we totally respected your integrity and that you told us you weren't going to do it and that you didn't give us that quick fix, we still wanted that information and will you give it to us? So it's very fascinating that they wanted it. They respected me for not giving it to them, but they still wanted it. So isn't it funny that we still want that information, that we crave it, we want that information, we want to default to it. It really says something, right? Um, so I would just encourage us to not do it, not provide it, or provide it after the fact, right? right? I agree. Yeah, I agree okay. With, um, with the B vitamins for sure. Yeah. I guess it depends on the like True. Mm -hmm. is very right. hard to get out yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm saying we're going to figure that vitamin <laughs> D thing out. And I think vitamin it. D is really complicated too. I mean, yeah, I, I probably have an intermediate approach where, like I was saying yesterday, I think of it, I think of the supplementation as, and this is a conversation probably for this whole, um, and I had some people actually come up <laughs> to me yesterday and say, oh my gosh, I just realized I'm supplementing my farm <laughs> and not my body. You know, I've been like, so I've been saying like yeah. supplement, not taking supplements. I'm only mm. doing it from food. But with the BFA strategy, I've been super focused on supplementing my farm in the exact way you were talking about supplementing the body. Mm. And it's true. And I actually think they, that style, and you know, I'm sure I will evolve as I practice too. I think it's, we're getting a lot of feedback from this process. Yeah. Um, but it is, I think of it as it, from that cofactor approach of, yeah, our goal is to build the dynamism in the system overall, which is going to increase our capacity to use food as our source, as well as working on our food supply and working on our food sourcing as individual people. Um, and while when we're in this process, like this is what John Kemp was talking about with their like AI agronomist project. It's like if you see a pathogen coming, it, the Colorado potato beetles are going to be released, um, you know, emerge in your area in the next couple of weeks, and you're getting data back from your farm that it is that there's a molybdenum deficiency and that the you know plants aren't processing nitrogen in the way they should be. That you're open for a Colorado potato beetle infestation, mm -hmm. and so his program, the design is you know they're going to come, they're going to offer you some information that says if you supplemented your farm with molybdenum right now, you would start metabolizing nitrogen in a way that would avoid that right. Colorado potato beetle, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. That is just a total game changer. But, and, and I'm saying essentially the same thing for human nutrition. Mm -hmm. If we see if, and, and, the, and part of our problem with human nutrition, just like it is in the farm system, is our data collection. It's not yeah. perfect. Right. So I'm trying to interpret symptoms or whatever testing I'm using. The tests all have their strengths and weaknesses. I'm, you know, I'm not seeing the truth. I'm seeing a version yes. of the truth. And I'm trying to make an educated guess as the practitioner about what is your body telling me about where some of these limited conversions are happening and where they're leaving you open to your own version of a Colorado potato beetle infestation. And can, if we added a little bit of molybdenum, great example actually, yeah. now, 
Yeah. Would your sulfur metabolism get better in the human body? And would you be able to be producing you know, glutathione in a way that kept up with this oxidative need? And so I do see something like these, these, um, yeah, these micronutrient additions facilitating tolerance, facilitating enzymatic responses in the body, and they, and they are coming from supplements sometimes. Like, I am not, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced that I'm getting someone's molybdenum need up from food. Mm -hmm. And so I'm adding supplemental molybdenum in the best form I can find, in the most energy I can learn about, and what I see is someone's tolerance to sulfur increasing. And so then, then we can start to eat more of the foods like broccoli and um, you know, onions and these things that have been really challenging. And now we're like more up and running. But I, think, I don't think there's a wrong way yeah. in these approaches. Totally. I think you can probably do it both ways. Yeah. And I'm not not supplementing, so just to be clear, to, uh, <laughs> yeah, just to be clear. She had red wine last night. <laughs> there were some supplements going down last night. Let's just be perfectly clear on that. Yeah. Uh, no, but, but to, to just to reemphasize, when we supplement first, and it also kind of speaks to what Fred Provenza observed, when you put the nutrients in first, we change what the body may potentially do. Mm -hmm. Is the body going to then crave nutrient-dense food if you meet the need first? Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking people to consider is with, when you give, people come to my office with spreadsheets of supplements, literally Excel spreadsheets, mm -hmm. okay? They're managing their supplemental intake on apps, spreadsheets, mm -hmm. data points, I'm like, this needs to stop. <laughs> All of it needs to stop. Okay, this is not health. They're spending an extraordinary amount of money and data taking in individual nutrients. That's what I'm talking about. That is not health, okay? And it's happening all the time, and everyone's doing it. People have entire cabinets dedicated to supplement. I have lots of supplements. I have bought every supplement on the market, just so you know. So it is not that I do, and I'm curious about them. I want to know how they work, what are they. My point is, if you keep bringing those into the body, it is changing your food preference. Essentially, we don't want, we want to be driving our choices based on what the body is craving, what it needs, and if you keep meeting that need. So I'm not talking about you know, preventing the body from doing, improving a process by meeting an individual need. That is intelligent. That's a really smart decision to do that. I also do intracellular testing to see if there's mineral deficiencies. I would help somebody get better by meeting a specific need in the body. I'm not about torturing people. <laughs> but we also want to discourage people from meeting that need artificially. That's really what I'm speaking to because you have to remember that people are doing this on their own. They are in Facebook groups with 300,000 other people recommending supplements to each other. They are trying to figure it out on their own. They don't know where to go. They're not working with practitioners like Jordan, although they should. They are not getting that kind of, a, of an intelligent conversation about what do I need to do next. There are not enough practitioners for sick people. Do we, do, so, right? so, so how that's do we the frustration. Get, so how do we get back to that child <laughs> that is choosing that cottage cheese or that cod liver oil or the eggs? If given the choice of a buffet as a, as a child, how do I, I go to the ones yeah. that I know my body needs? Well, that's needs. my point. You first have how to do start we get back putting to all that supplements in. So like kind of what you're saying, how do we stop, how do we get back to that place where we have that intuitive? For one, we have to stop putting synthetic vitamins in the body in excessive amounts because mm -hmm. we're overriding that data mm -hmm. by providing all of this, in, that's information. Now you have lots of magnesium and zinc coming in and B vitamins and curcumin and, and resveratrol. No. And you write it. <laughs> no, but really, these are what people are buying. This is, are we not buying all of this? Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, everyone's buying it. Mm -hmm. Don't lie. <laughs> and you br bring all of this in, and I get text messages all the time. What's the right multivitamin? What m multiminerals should I be getting? What should I be buying for my kids? What do you think about this? They're taking pictures of it. They're going around to stores. Is this a good one? Should I get this? What about this one? So people are trying to reduce inflammation. They're trying to get rid of brain fog. They're trying to look at the poor nutrients that their children are consuming and offset that by offering them a multivitamin, a multimineral. Mm. 
they have children that are athletes that they think are run down. They have adrenal fatigue. They have inflammation. They have uh, insomnia. They're not sleeping well. They're taking melatonin. I mean, this is what we're hearing, right? This is exactly what people are doing, and they're trying to offset the damage by taking in supplements to reduce the oxidative damage in the body. So when they do that, and then they go and sit down, and things don't taste right, or they don't, they're not hungry, or, it, or you know, they don't know how to get back to that place, it's because the body is confused. It doesn't really have that information. It's, it's, it's not getting the right message. So that's really where I wa I'm trying to just mm -hmm. speak to that point. That's all. I'm not saying people shouldn't be getting a high level of nutrients from supplementation or certainly working with a practitioner that can guide them. That is a beautiful um, experience to have. Well, and then we have CBDs on top of it. To really oh, oh, yeah, people. everything. But you had a question, and yeah. you've been raising it for <laughs> 10 minutes. I oh, appreciate hi. that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And that's supplements, but in a different way. So I'm just curious on how you feel about that, or if that's even valid in the same <laughs> conversation, or if, like, are people, that, I use the word for the juice bar, and people come in and be like, I don't even know anything about this, just make me healthy. I'm talking to Dr. Oz and Yeah. Um, I think for, for, for me, uh, professionally and personally, I think it's all in context of how you're using it. Um, you know, if you're using better it... better than a donut. Yeah, if you're <laughs> using it to get healthy, like if that's your diet. I see people who literally will have six green juices or, you know, a day. I would say that would not be a wise choice. You'll get an oxalate sensitivity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you are putting yourself out of balance. Um, and I just think you know you need to eat food because your microbes are looking for food and they're not looking for liquid all day. Um, and there's nothing for them to chew on. So they need to chew um, because when they chew, when your microbes chew, they're actually producing um, you know, uh, short chain fatty acids. And it is through that short chain fatty acid production that you're actually repairing the mucosal lining. So I actually prefer that they chew the fiber and the vegetables um, than to just run them through a machine. Having said that, you know, if my boys are going out in the morning, it's, I, it, I haven't, I've been said to run fresh ginger through a mm -hmm. juicer with a little bit of carrot, and they take it as a shot. Mm -hmm. um, so we wouldn't, run, we wouldn't have like a giant juice thing, but it would be like a shot glass um, in addition to the breakfast that they're eating. So that would be one way that we might inclu include and that's really a time element, you know, so I'm not going to start sauteing vegetables in the morning for three kids. I've got to get three out the door in a very short amount of time. So, you know, I think it's just an element of what you're doing. If you're traveling, sometimes people will do juices on the run if they not have access to a lot of produce, so that's another way. So it just depends on how you're using it, I think. Um, um, so I'm not, uh, I'm not for or against any particular food. I just think it's within the context of how you're using it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And back. I think yesterday what I was talking about is just chewing is, our human chewing is a really important yeah. part of setting our digestive system up. So even if someone is doing smoothies, I say, put something in it that's not blended, that yeah. you can chew. Yeah. Make mm -hmm. sure that you're taking time, because otherwise, our, not only is our um, digestive response impaired, but our blood sugar response is impaired, and so people don't actually release enough insulin to cover whatever they ingested, and they get a big blood sugar spike from the same nutrients they would have ingested in a whole food form. Well, and when you have a whole food in your mouth, you, you, your saliva starts to say, oh, wait, there's an apple coming in. Yes. So, you know, wait a minute, I, I need to start excreting what I need yes. in order to be able to digest this. Exactly. Yeah. And um, enzymes, too. There's specific enzymes that activate the body, that turn certain compounds into, from an inactive to an activated form. So we see that in broccoli sprouts. Like, broccoli sprouts are very anti-cancer, anti-everything. But there's a myronase uh, enzyme in the mouth that turns the broccoli sprouts from inactive to an activated state. And that happens when you chew them. So when you actually break the cell wall for the chewing process, that's actually what turns that active process on. So when we look at all the research, we see all this stuff about broccoli sprouts, but the chewing process is really where it's at. But how do they, how does, how does your body know they're coming? What do you mean? No, when you chew it. I know. Oh, oh how do they know? Yeah, 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 exactly. It's like right it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Information. Yeah, exactly. Back in the back. Logan. So I love this conversation, uh, the analogy of supplementing on the farm in the same way that people mm -hmm. are supplementing their bodies. And of course, like we know, it's 
the supplement companies as well as the agricultural input <laughs> companies are making bank off of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so along the lines of like the, the mineral and vitamin perspective in the supplement industry, could we bridge that over to the, the big boom in probiotics and how um, like all the recent microbiome research is just like leading to everyone and their mom coming out with a new probiotic product. Simultaneously in agriculture, everyone and their mom coming out with a new bacterial or fungal inoculant. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see if y'all could speak to the point that um, taking a pill or putting an inoculant in your soil, inoculating your gut with that could be good in the beginning and it can be beneficial if you have depleted um, microbial populations, but it's not Yes. It's not an end-all, be-all, and I think some people use it as a way to circumvent actually like changing their diet. So if you're taking a bunch of probiotics, making those companies rich, and then simultaneously <laughs> drinking chlorinated water, yeah. and, 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 and doing whatever, right? and then yeah. just continuously adding that supplement back in. I mean, these, these things didn't exist in our ancestry. Juicers and blenders didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, can we go back to fermented foods and um, the pounder smoothie? Creating your own <laughs> order and pass food, changing your diet without needing a probiotic. Yeah, and I just want to respect everyone's time. It is 10.30, so it is time to go on a break. And, and um, if, if that's a question, maybe we could answer that and sure. kind of wrap up um, this yeah. panel. And yeah. if you have to go, please do. I think right. it's a great example of this whole, it could be a microcosm for this whole conversation. Which is, um, yeah, I, so absolutely, I mean, probiotics w um, that are on the market, wildly understudied, no even classification for what is a probiotic. Like, you have no idea, A, what's in that bottle, but B, what effect it's going to have. And, and the strain specificity is so important when it comes to probiotics. It is, you know, if, if you say a poodle and a gr German Shepherd are the same dog, I mean, are both a dog, they are, but does that mean that they are, you know, that you would that they would have the same results in your household? Probably not. Um, so that's how you really do, I find that it's super important to think about strain specificity and what's been studied when it comes to probiotics. There, there's a website, a um, database I love, it's called Probiotic Advisor by Jason Horlack. He can, you can, it's like maybe a $30 membership per year and you can type in either a condition or a strain and he'll show you all the data that has been compiled on that strain or and what um, products it's in and, and whether they've been studied. So that's a huge resource for people. But what I think about with probiotics is that, I mean, we're getting good data that most of them don't colonize the gut. So it's so the same thing, honestly, with I think pharma inoculants. This is yeah. not, that's not how we restore the microbial ecology. It could be a way to change the conversation yeah. between your GI tract and your immune system in that moment. Yeah. So if there's a really challenging conversation going on between the ecology you have in your GI tract and the immune system that's riding herd on that ecology, then what I find is that some strains of probiotics specific to the person, specific, you know, well studied, can actually have quite a dramatic effect on sort of calming that conversation down for a little bit while we do some other work. Um, which can include, you know, changing your relationship to histamine or some of these other problematic, challenging compounds. But that's not the end game at all. You know, that is, we're changing the conversation so that we can start to change these other conversations about our relationship to food, but not so that, you know, we're, that's not going to heal the gut. Great. Over. One more question? Okay. <laughs> I, I just want to add something to that, it wasn't what I was going to say, but the, when you take probiotics, they're not going to replace the bacteria in your gut because you only, well first of all, the bacteria are all over your body, not just your gut. It's but, true. But you produce and sustain your own bacterial content. Yeah. So what the, the only thing the probiotics can do is help the environment of your body. And, and, uh, yeah. So that you can replenish thinking. your own bacteria. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was the one comment. But the other thing I wanted to say, because I'm very interested in your notion of information. It's a great, I'd like to read your book and see how you're defining it. <laughs> when you talk about vitamins, it's interesting because when, we, when you extract vitamins and then take them as supplements, the question is, is that really the information that was in the food that is going to actually no. help you? 
It know. may be that the information that, that somebody thought was in some B6 vitamin is actually a link between a B6 vitamin and something else in the carrot. So that the supplements really, you know, we've synthesized them down so much that we've lost their connections to the rest of the food. And they're independent. And they're independent. Yeah. Correct. Oh, no. Remember mm -hmm. how these supplements came about? They came about because people realized we had no nutrition in our food. And then what do we do? Ah, take vitamins. You know, take one a day vitamins. And right. Supplements are bad food we're giving you. Or they came about because somebody realized an opportunity to um, or they make came a profit. About, I mean, yeah. one or the other. But yeah. also, Guido talked about peristalsis in like 1400, making these tinctures where he would distill the essence of the plant in tincture form, and then he would burn the plant down to its mineral ash, put it back in the tincture, and give it to people. And even in 1400, saw benefit to that concentrated mineral mm -hmm. approach. So I think. We, it's, we don't know what we're looking at, right. and let's all get curious yeah. and, and be really, you know, get, gather our data and know that food is our source and that we're in a challenging environment that we're all trying to navigate, and that conversation is it's going to look complex. Yeah, and I just want to leave, too, with uh, just a couple things because I think it's important um, to emphasize clinically with uh, probiotics. We know that they're not um, they're not sporing and they're not staying. They're transient, so they move to the digestive tract. But they are changing the microbial diversity uh, in in individuals. So even in their short stay, uh, they can change the diversity of the existing population. So we know that in very specific cases. So in the presence of specific types of pathology, like if somebody's prone to uh, respiratory issues or lung infections or colitis or diverticulitis or other types of things, in the presence of specific species, when we bring them into the body, they change the diversity of other strains that are already there. So it's not that those are inoculating the digestive tract or in any other place. They're not staying there, but they're changing the strains that are already mm -hmm. there. So they're shifting the microbiome, so it's important to keep that in mind. So clinically, they are moving things around and influencing the other microbes. So it's not, you have to always consider that microbes are making an impact in other ways. It's not just, oh, are these microbes actually uh, staying in, in the gut or in the colon? They, they mm -hmm. information that's exactly right. right. So, so that, that's important to think of. So we do also track that data and think about in that, in that context. So clinically, it can be used uh, to shift somebody out of a, uh, dis uh, of a state of, of poor health. Did you have and one, that's more, one more point? No, and I just want to say there's a fireside chat after the break, so if people want to talk more, mm -hmm. um, you know, they certainly we can do that. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you both.